Let's do one more example of limits. Uh, I'll probably end this short series here. Um, and this is designed to lead to how would you use limits, for example, to calculate a derivative of a function, uh, or more generally, the notion of the limit of a function, f of x, where x is a real variable input, it's not a sequence right now, as x approaches some fixed uh, constant real number a. Um, so, and it turns out that we can really use our sequence limit knowledge to get most of the way there. Um, so, for example, let's take a real simple function, y equals f of, of x is x squared. So there's our graph. Ooh, i got to label my axes. Um, and I would like to know the slope of the tangent line to that graph at, let's say, x equals 3. Um, often that fixed value is called a, or maybe x naught. And the, the idea there is that if we, let's say, blow up that section, it's a curve, it's not a straight line, so it doesn't have a slope in an ordinary sense. But if you take that x equals 3 and you go a little bit over and then take another point on the same curve, then you can connect them with a straight line. That's called a secant line. Secare in Latin meaning to cut, cuts the, the curve in two places, and you can find the slope of that. Now, if these points are fairly well separated, like say, let's say 3 and 4, then that uh, slope is not going to be very close to the actual slope of the tangent line. But the claim is, and this is a central claim of calculus, is that if you take like 3 and 3.1, or 3 and 3.01, and you look at that secant line, that's zooming in very, very tightly on the original graph, and you're going to get a better and better approximation for something you could call, you could define to be, in fact, the slope of the tangent line. And so the definition of the slope of the tangent line, or the derivative of this function, oops, that's going away, um, is in fact the limit of the slopes of those secant lines. So that's rather quick in terms of derivatives, but let's, it's just motivation for us right here. Um, I'll have lots of other videos. I already have other videos on derivatives. Um, so what we're going to take is we're going to take the limit. Okay, in principle, we could let this, this is often called like h or delta x, the change in x. And in principle, we could take any real number here. And it is important to develop the theory really carefully to be able to take any real number and make sure that the limit um, works no matter what that real number is. But we can do it a little um, cheaply by just saying, let's take the limit as n goes to infinity and just look at the special cases where this quantity, h or delta x, whatever you want to call it, is just 1 over n. That certainly lets us get arbitrarily small. If I take, and in fact, that was exactly cases that I was just doing. 4 is where n is 1. 3.1 is where n is 10. 3.01 is where n is 100. I'm just going from 3 and going over some, 1 over some big integer. That's going to give me an idea of starting at my base point 3 and going over a small amount. So I'm going to take um, 3 plus 1 over n. That gives us a family of points that are a little bit bigger than 3 uh, squared. And then, OK, I'm going to, to take the slope of a line, I take the rise. So that's going to be the value here. That's 3 plus 1 over n squared minus the value at the base point. That's just 3 squared. And then I need to divide. That's rise over run to get to slope equals, okay? And the run, I already set that to be equal. That's this um, deviation in x, that's this, the separation in x that I put in, and I chose that to be 1 over n. Okay. So, again, you could imagine a function where this quantity has a nice limit, but if you put in, like, something that wasn't of the form 1 over n here, like pi over n or root 2 over n, something weird, that you might get totally different answers. That just doesn't happen at a basic calculus level. We just don't deal with weird functions like that. Um, so this isn't exactly how you're going to see the definition of a derivative, but um, this is getting a long way there, and uh, it's a good way um, uh, to transition to the definition of a limit that's a bit more general about real functions of real variables and that is actually used in the careful definition of a derivative. Okay, and the great thing is this is going to be really easy to calculate, and then prove rigorously with our usual definitions. Okay, so let's just do a little bit more in this little space we have here. Okay, 
there's a lot of cancellations that are going to happen here. Um, first of all, uh, I'm dividing by a fraction, so I'm just going to say, okay, dividing by 1 over n is just times n. That's a pretty easy simplification to do. Okay, and let's go ahead and... Um, and I think I can take all this stuff out. I'll leave the basic picture. Okay, so lim as n goes to infinity of n times... Um, okay, let's expand that square out, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So 9 plus 6 over n plus 1 over n squared minus 9. And not shocking, the 9s also cancel. Because after all, this quantity is the rise when n gets really, really big, I'm not going very far over. I shouldn't be going very far up unless this is a really bad function. It doesn't deserve to have a tangent line. And so these 9s canceling out guarantees that this rise number, notice that's very small if n is big, it's very big. And then I'm dividing it by the also small run number, 1 over n. But here I've um, simplified the algebra already so it ends up being multiplying by a big number. Okay, yet another cancellation happens. n times 6 over n is just 6, and n over n squared is 1 over n. So, and this is a, a key thing about how limits get actually done operationally in a basic calculus class. It's really just algebra, mostly. Um, it's taking a uh, an algebraic expression that has to be written at the start in a very special way so that it actually means what it's supposed to mean, rise over run, but is unnecessarily complicated algebraically if you want to know the answer. Do the algebra to simplify it, and very often there's going to be some wonderful simplifications. And sometimes the limit's going to be really obvious, especially if you don't really insist on proving it. If n is a really, really huge number, 6 plus 1 over that huge number, it's going to be real close to 6. I predict the limit is 6. Okay, but since this is a video about careful, the careful definition, so let's prove that the limit, as n goes to infinity, of 6 plus 1 over n really is 6. Notice, I'm not going to go back to the original formulation. That was rock-solid algebra. That just, Nobody needs to over-justify that. We know that this expression is equal to 6 plus 1 over n for any finite n. We just did then need to show that the actual limit-taking step uh, is correct. Okay, well, how big does n have to be so that 6 plus 1 over n is within epsilon of 6? Okay, well, basically that's the error. That's what we have to show is small. That has to be less than epsilon. So, I'm going to do just a little what do we need kind of step. I'm going to put it in brackets because you wouldn't have to absolutely write this in a, a very um, concise proof. But we need 1 over n to be less than epsilon. Um, oh, so in other words, we, um, we need n to be greater than 1 over epsilon. Oh, okay, so we'll let big N be 1 over epsilon. Oh, and we want it to be an integer, so let's sealing it like we did before just to make sure it's an integer and just err on the side of being a little cautious, going a little bit bigger. Okay, so there's our waiting time. And the claim is that if we make sure we, we make people wait to 1 over epsilon, well, first we ask people what their error tolerance is, the epsilon. We say, take 1 over that. Take 1 over that small number, you're going to get a big number. Make sure you bump that up to the next integer. Let that be your waiting time. And then we're going to claim that any time after that, as long as we take an n bigger than that, um, then we're going to get a number that's to within the desired tolerance of 6. Okay, all right, so this was just the sort of working out what we're probably going to need here. And now this, this is the start of what you'd write, what you have to write, even if you're not trying to explain where it came from. So let n be uh, the, the ceiling of 1 over epsilon. Uh, so if little n is after the waiting time, then uh, certainly n is greater than 1 over epsilon because it's bigger than something that's the ceiling of 1 over epsilon, so yeah, we're good. Okay, and so we just invert this. So 1 over n is less than epsilon, and so 6 plus 1 over n is between 6 plus epsilon and 6 minus epsilon. And that's what we want. Okay, and we're done. Now, uh, so, what, what did we just show? We just showed the fairly obvious uh, fact that when we did this algebra, we realized that the answer we get is very, very close to 6. And when n is big, and remember that was when this, this h or delta x number, which is actually 1 over n, when that's small, you're getting a bunch of, t of secant slopes that are getting closer and closer to 6. And we're just making sure that we really dot our i's and cross our t's. And we say in this 
step right here, we're actually letting people know, hey, you know, if you if you don't aren't doing the idealization, if you aren't just answering what the limit is, if you actually want to know how close these two points that define the secant line need to be in order to get a good estimate, here's here's what it is. If epsilon is like 10 to the minus 6, you want that kind of accuracy, one over that is a million, and so make make sure you let n be at least a million. Um, so often, I, I've talked about this before, most of the time for theoretical results, and like to kind of push the theory through and make things elegant, you do this once as, or as few times as possible, and then you prove a bunch of results that get away from the epsilons and n's. But often, if you talk to the engineer, they might say, you know what, I actually don't, I'm not looking at a tangent line. I'm actually looking at this curve, and I'm actually sampling two honest-to-God points that aren't right at the same point. I'm not taking a limit. I'm actually taking some delta x, which is, let's say, you know, 10 to the minus 6, something like that. What does that do? Does that get me within the accuracy I want to, um, to claim that that's close to the tangent slope? Um, and so often looking at the guts of one of these proofs might be necessary to talk to the, the engineer who wants what's called an effective result instead of a just, hey, this works, and I won't tell you the details or how to get the decimal places right. Making a result like this effective means what do you need to do, and what are the error estimates, what are the precise error estimates? So there is some value to this. Um, let's see, there's one other thing I was going to say. Oh, yeah, so one thing I should say, this was a very one-sided thing. So again, this isn't the careful way you do derivatives. It was just a nice way to, to get most of the way there with, with the limit of a, a, a sequence concept. You'd also want to make sure, it'd be really weird if you had something like this, where you start with 3, and all this works out really, really nicely when you take this, or this, or this, or this, and then maybe, like, it's totally different over here. That would be bad, and, and usually you would not say that the tangent line uh, works here, okay? So we also need, we need it to work for, uh, let's say, delta x is less than 0, okay? Um, and that's a little bit trickier to put into this kind of framework. And that's one of the places where the, the official definition of the limit as x goes to a of f of x, limit of a function of a real variable, is, is a bit better, um, as well as more, more precise. Um, but I like being able to show that this idea of a limit really can get you to at least calculate and give an, an idea of why certain super important limits like slopes of tangent lines derivatives are what they are. And, and why you could how you could actually justify it.